Art Chat TV is brought to you by Linda Fissler Fine Art. Visit her website at lindafissler.com. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Art Chat. My name is Linda Riesenberg Fissler, and I'm your host today. Um, and actually, like uh, you probably noticed that on YouTube, we're now Art Chat TV. So welcome to that as well. Today, I have Robin Esquini. Yeah, so Robin studied illustration at Sheridan College in Toronto and art and design at Parsons the New School in New York. So she's got quite a connection there, Toronto and, and New York. After pursuing a commercial art career for over a decade, she completed the classical drawing and painting program at the Academy of Realist Art, which I want to learn more about, about Doreen, because that's a new one on me. Some of the other things that we uh, that I'll read here in a few minutes, we have a common thread going through there. Mm -hmm. um, so the Academy of Realist Art is where she studied her classical drawing and painting program and has since worked full time as a painter and art instructor. Yay. <laughs> uh, she has won numerous awards for her paintings from the Society of Canadian Artists, the Federation of Canadian Artists, Canadian Portrait Society, Bold Brush, and the Art Renewal Center. Recently, she exhibited in New York at the Salma Gundy Club. And if you all know me, you know how that connection to the Salma Gundy Club as well. Um, the open figurative exhibition is where she was exhibited in. And the Dasha Gallery yeah, 13th right. Anniversary Group Exhibit. Her work is held in private collections internationally. Welcome, Robin. Thank you for Thanks joining so much. Thanks so much, Linda. I appreciate it. It's great. Yeah, uh, uh, tell us a little bit about your journey, how you got to where you were. We talked about it a little bit when I introduced you, but I'm sure there were some great learnings along the way that you could kind of pass on to our listeners. Of course. Um, so yeah, so I didn't really take the traditional fine art route. Um, I was always really interested in drawing and painting. So throughout high school, I took, you know, a bunch of art courses and I always really enjoyed it. Um, I think hearing, you know, growing up, I've always heard that you can't make a living as a fine artist. So I think I opted to go into illustration instead. Um, and that actually led me to a commercial career in illustration and graphic design. Mm -hmm. um, so you can see some of the letters behind me. Like I'm a, I'm a tight nerd too, uh, as well <laughs> as a painter. Um, so yeah, and, and then maybe five or six years ago, I uh, took my drawing and painting much more seriously. I did want to give the fine art route uh, a go. And I'm so happy I did because today I am working as a full-time artist and teaching, um, which is fantastic. And I, you know, I'm so grateful every day. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, and that is such a leap. I, it, every artist out there that's probably listening to us understands that, you know, wonderful leap um, that you've taken. Um, so tell us a little bit about uh, your first school of study where you decided to take your classical drawing um, and, and kind of veer off from illustration. As I said in the introduction, I haven't really heard of that one before. Is it in Canada? Yeah, it is. So it's okay. probably <laughs> the biggest one in, in uh, well, located in Toronto, um, the Academy of Realist Art. And it's, as far as I'm concerned, probably the best one in Canada. I was doing quite a bit of research before. Um, and apart from, you know, maybe other instructors where you can do independent study, um, the, yeah, the Academy of Realist Art to me was um, a really great find. And uh, yeah, so they teach traditional drawing and painting methods. So you start off like in some, like in most kind of ateliers, I guess the Florence Academy of Art and uh, GCA, you do the bargs, which are these mm -hmm. um, copies of these drawing plates. And then you graduate to doing these charcoal drawings from casts. And then after uh, you start painting in black and white, and then you go into full color and do still lifes and learn about composition and, and all of that throughout the program. Right, yeah. So um, one of the things that, I forgot to mention is that Robin and I are mentors at Mastrius. And yeah. it's really interesting because I, I think Art Chat has provided me with this solid base ground, uh, a basic of uh, all the different types of, right, of art, um, realism, representational, landscapes, seascapes, et cetera, um, you know, studying the past masters, all of that that we used to do. And, and I, something hit me when you were saying that, you know, you, you paint in black and white you know, or grayscale mm -hmm. to learn things because taking the color out of that. And that's one of the things that that I've taken away from, even for landscape painting, because it really does 
at least the way that I use it, um, helps you sort out values. So oh my God. I think, I think learning about values is probably for somebody who just gravitates more towards color, like me learning how to, uh, separate your values and really kind of create more of that structure is so, so integral to actually building up to painting. So, um, yeah, just even that exercise of, you know, learning to do so much in black and white, um, to then going into full color, it really kind of, you know, that's, a, it builds a strong foundation. Yeah, do that. you find that it builds also your, um, knowledge of color and how to use specific color? Completely. So like now when I'm looking at color, the first thing I'm looking at, um, apart from, you know, hue and how the chroma, like the color intensity of it, mm -hmm. is definitely the value and, oh, is this going to be lighter or darker than this other value that I've already have on the, on the canvas. Right. So yeah, having that um, and that's how you, you create three-dimensional form, right? Because if light is, you're basically painting light, right? So if the light is hitting an object and, you know, as, as the light turns around the object, it, it goes from light to dark. So you really have to control those values in order to render that three-dimensionality. Right. Yeah. And I see in, in, of course, the study of edges comes with that. And it's so much easier for me um, mm -hmm. when we're painting with edges or worrying about edges or how we want the eye to flow through the painting we really start with that strong foundation of taking color out of it. Color's the fun part for me. Is it for you? Cause like, I, yeah, I, 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 I love color, yeah. but color. Yeah. It's so um, I have such an, I think most people have such an emotional response to color and that to me, it, at least for my own personal work, like it adds that kind of like additional emotion to it, whether it's like more muted and more subtle and that's kind of the vibe that I'm going for or something that's really kind of intense and bright and fun. So it, it gives you that range, right? Whereas, yeah, for value, it, it's much more kind of creating that base structure. Yeah, and I also find that when I start with a black and white uh, value scale, whatever, however you want to describe it, you mm -hmm. know, I also find that I've thought through everything. Um, if I'm smart, I've stepped back. <laughs> you notice I said, if I'm smart, I step back yeah. and I look at it and it's like, where's my eye going? What catches my eye? I can tone it down. And this is before, you know, I'm, I'm all, you, you start almost like a playbook of, oh, I know what color I'm going to put there. And I, you know, I know what edge I'm going to use. And yeah, you know, I can't explain, I think uh, enough to the listeners because I, I see a lot of folks that are having a hard time with color and a lot mm -hmm. of it stems from those foundational pieces. Can can you think besides edges and I and I don't mean to set you up here, but edges and color uh, are two things that you can work out when you're doing your value scale, mm -hmm. more or less your color pattern. Is do you think brush work at that stage, or do you just kind of you know let that happen as you get into the color part? I think when you're starting. I think it depends on your intention, right? So if like you want to start out, like there's two ways of starting out a painting, right? You can go like from loose to tight, or you can start tight right away and build more tightly on that foundation and then maybe kind of loosen things up as you go along. Mm -hmm. um, I think the brushwork for sure, at least for my painting, um, I'm uh, like uh, brush, like the brushes that I use, I, I'm very like concerned about, I guess, uh, when I'm first starting out. So uh, for my smaller works, especially like I'll, I'll use kind of bigger, um, more bristle brushes, even like fan brushes sometimes just to get like kind of a loose feel to it before mm -hmm. I even start. But, um, yeah, so I think to your point, I think brushes are, are huge, um, shape. I think shape is part of that, right? So if you're talking about edges and value shape is probably that third, um, item, even before you start considering like chroma and, um, and hue as well. So yeah, like I'm, it, it's kind of like a push and pull, right? So as you're developing something, you're looking at, yes, the edges, the shape, what value it is, how much chroma to put. So you're, you're like, I'm in a constant dialogue with myself over the colors that I'm using and how I'm developing the painting. Yeah. Yeah. It, and it's, it's nice because at that, that, st that stage is so much easier to correct a mistake then when you get into the the final stages and I consider putting color in something as the final stage, it's like put all the yeah. thinking up front and then just stand back and enjoy and, and, you know, putting color here and there and 
and yeah. that. It, I mean, I think that's like grease eyes or like underpaintings or even like a, a kind of a, a total underpainting is, mm -hmm. is so, um, it's like so widely used by, by so many artists, right? Cause like it's, you're sort of separating, separating it out, right? You're doing the value first, you're doing the structure first, and then you're considering the color after. So kind of breaking it up into two steps is, yeah, it's, it ends up being really helpful. And when you have that strong design, you can turn around and, and just at that point, I mean, I find myself thinking about um, which color complement and color pattern and scheme I want to use. You know, is this going to be mm -hmm. yellow purple or is it going to be red green or is it going to be blue orange or am I going to try something weird and put orange with green? And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> kinda, yeah, because I mean, if you look at the landscape, there's orange out there and with sitting right next to green and Mother Nature is wonderful. But you know, it's just, yeah. Uh, one day I may be standing there thinking, oh, maybe purple, yellow. And the next day I come up, I'm painting in a different area and I'm thinking of a totally different color scheme, which, you know, it really disciplines your mind. And I think the the study that you went through and even your career mm -hmm. um, as an illustrator, you know, really puts in mind with, you know, okay, I got the basics down. Then I have to, you know, now I can play with what my color scheme is going to be. And of course. And I think, yeah, to your point, I think like the illustration to or just like evaluating color in in different ways, like whether right. it's landscape painting, whether it's like figurative work, whether I'm doing it like in my design and illustration work too, um, you you can really find almost a whole bunch of colors even in like a small area, right? So whether it's like a blue purple contrast or like a blue uh, uh, orange contrast or like a yellow purple contrast, like even just in a small area of the painting. I mean, if you look at Van Gogh's painting, for example, like he's he's putting blue against you know, orange and it, it works and right. probably why, because he's controlling that, that value scale. Right. Exactly. Yeah. There's a reason why he's called a tonalist, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And that's the thing, like, it was, it's so interesting to me because I, I actually just did a workshop at the Academy of Realist Art. Um, I taught a workshop a couple of weeks ago. And one of the things that I did, it was a portrait painting workshop, but what I enjoyed doing is that um, I, I, I showed a few different, um, kind of like uh, paintings from both like the Renaissance and even like modern modernist paintings. And what they all had in common is that when I changed the colors to black and white, they all still worked, right? They all right. looked three-dimensional. They all still held together, right? So, right, right, yeah. Um, that was so interesting to me. Well, it, and I, yeah, I definitely think that if you start out, um, you know, everybody think, and, and the funny thing is everybody think when you start saying, okay, I'm going to have you start out. And I'm sure that you probably rolled your eyes too, when you got to the <laughs> point where it's, you know, six weeks of black and white. Oh my God, I'm going to go crazy. Six weeks. <laughs> Try oh, two no. years of black two and white. Years? Oh my gosh. Yeah. I didn't know it was that long. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, okay. so they, and it's really funny because like, again, some of, some of my private students are just like, can we start color yet? And I'm like, yeah, we can. But I also want you to do the black and white stuff too, because I because I know how valuable it is, right? right and especially right. if you're a colorist, especially if you gravitate towards color, you know, even just taking a step back, going back and to doing the black and white uh, drawings and paintings is is so helpful to to kind of keep that top of mind whenever you're creating your own work. Yeah. So I didn't I didn't have the instruction that you have um, mm -hmm. at. I d I didn't go to a formal school for art. Um, I. Mm -hmm. I went to the Procter and Gamble University of Hard Knocks, so <laughs> um, <laughs> and I didn't do anything uh, market. I worked in baby diapers, so <laughs> wow. I mean, in that department, not actually in baby diapers, but right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so a lot of the study and everything I've done, um, you know, having great mentors, um, mm -hmm. one being Kevin and all this, but even I mean, Kevin is is a very big colorist. I mean, you know, he's yeah. known for a lot of his colors and stuff like that. So for me to step back and start painting black and white, it was like, why are you doing that? <laughs> you know, but it's made me learn so much. And I always like think back to Ansel Adams and his black and white mm. photography and how oh strong God. that is. And I, I love like, Ansel Adams. Yeah, I call it, yeah. exactly. And I call it the Ansel Adams stage of, but I don't do it for two years. <laughs> but I, mean, I don't make people do yeah. it for two years, but yeah, yeah. it's just, the amount, if you look at those two years, the amount of learning that you learned that you got when you were, um, you know, doing that, it, yeah, it probably got to the point where it's like, oh, good, go buy some more ivory black. And, you know. <laughs> at least it was less expensive to buy yes. art supplies when you were just working with a couple of colors. <laughs> That's no true. Cadmiums <laughs> in there, you know. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, the first yeah, but I, I mean, there's there's different ways to to go about it, right? Like you obviously took the. Uh, 
the the route where you study with different mentors or you, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and there's more than one way to get to where you want to be. Right. And, right. but I, you know, that being said, I am very fortunate that I, yeah, study at yeah, the Academy. Yeah. I, mean, I, I came, yeah, I came to art late. I mean, I was, mm-hmm. um, I'm more, I've been writing since I was writing since I was, um, eight, nine, 10 years old, was fascinated in screenplays and different things like that. So when I was working at PNG, I was actually writing, um, novels, like but not publishing at that point because it was all traditional publishing. So mine has always been, you know, I love the letters behind you. Like you were talking about your, your text part of, of you, but yeah. So I started on that side. I came to art very late. I started when I was 32, already had the job at Procter and Gamble. There was no way I was leaving that paycheck. (laughs) Yeah. So, um, (laughs) so it became right. Exactly. So it became more of a um, a journey where I was learning from reading and learning from mentors and taking a class at local art centers, which are, you know, if you're a hobbyist, I started out as a hobbyist, I could say, um, if you're a hobbyist, they're wonderful because you get a lot of great learning from instructors who probably have even studied art in college and, um, you know, going to, to your favorite instructor and uh, workshop and your favorite artists and things like that. So this whole world opened up to me um, back when I was 32 years old, 30 some years ago. So um, yeah, so, you know, I, I'm always excited to hear the folks who actually knew young, knew young, when they were young, that they wanted to become an artist and wanted to go along that that line. So I'm always fascinated with with people like your story <laughs> versus people with my kind of story, although I'm still fascinated with it. But yeah, yeah so it, I mean, it just, ways. it goes to show. Yeah. It just goes to show like, you don't have to be like, it doesn't matter what age you start. Right. Like right. you just kind of have to start doing and familiarize yourself with colors. And I mean, there's, you know, with YouTube and stuff too, like there's so much self-learning that you can do. Like there's so much great content out there by like so many talented artists that yeah. it, it's so, yeah, it, it becomes much easier now than yeah, definitely even like 10, 20 years ago. Yeah. It, it's, um, it's definitely an interesting industry if we just talk uh, or look at the industry by itself for a few um, minutes. And, the, um, the interesting thing that I find is where the disconnects are, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, you naturally would think that there's one where us artists are always in our studio creating. So it's kind of being lonely and isolated in our um, our little studio creating. Um in your case, you have a, a lot of different connections, like to the Salma Gundy Club that you had. So you, I'm sure there were artists there that you meet that you keep in touch with. Um, but it, you know, there's like this. The biggest disconnect I think there is is finding those connect, those collectors, and and trying to do that. And I, you know, everybody would say, well, no, no, that's the easy part. Just find a gallery. And it's like, no, that's not the easy part. You know, <laughs> it's it's the hardest part. And you know, yeah. I just. I get, I always become frustrated when someone asks me, so that's all I'm asking you, <laughs> you know, how do we find, and how do we find those collectors? I mean, it's, oh my God, <laughs> the only thing you can basically do is what we're doing, right? You, we, yeah, like, missions, we, you know, you just have on. to put your, put yourself out there. Yeah. Honestly, yeah. like I I'm trying to do a little bit of everything, right. I'm trying to teach and make connections that way. I'm going on your podcast, right? <laughs> I'm posting on social media pretty regularly. I'm submitting my work to art shows. So yeah, yeah I found my collectors in, in like a bunch of different ways. I don't think there's one place right. where they all exist. Yeah, there and if, is a... and if there is, please let me know. Yeah, yeah, the comments. <laughs> Post them I know, write in the comments section, <laughs> please. Yeah, um, yeah so I, I'm still to figure that out I'm, I, I think I'm constantly trying to figure out who my audience is too and for like it's interesting too because I've had I've done some landscape work in the past I've done some and uh, obviously like I'm, I'm much more of a figurative artist now and um, I do think it's, it's a little bit more challenging to sell figurative work at least in Canada um, in Canada there is a huge demand for landscapes and I think it's maybe in part due to the history of Canada and Canadian painting with the group of seven and a lot of landscape painters uh, kind of being popularized here. Uh, So yeah, I mean, I'm looking to to exhibit my work more internationally and see if I can find buyers that way. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about, uh, which I'm sure you know because of your studies, the the history of figurative Mm -hmm. art. I mean, when mm-hmm. I think of figurative art, one of the 
the most famous ones naturally is uh, Singer Sargent. Yeah. And, and that time frame, I think when you see this whole host of, and, and this could be very much that I'm just not that connected in figurative art because I don't paint it. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems like there was a lot of that work that kept people like Sargent and, and um, Val Valquez, I can't say his name right. You know, everybody who's, who you can think of fetching, um, you know, that painted all of these figurative works. We're doing it at a time when cameras weren't readily available. It was a very much a um, society thing. I'm having my portrait painted by, you know, and, and that hung in the house of the, you know, we have a, a Biltmore house here in Asheville, North Carolina, and they have a number of different portraits of the Vanderbilt family throughout the house. And it was like, that was the way of capturing them at that time frame. And then all of a sudden camera comes in, TV comes in, oh my God, social media comes in. And the effect on figurative art, is it harder? I mean, you said it was harder to sell, but is it? Yeah, it's it, it's interesting because like I, I I have done quite a bit of research on this. And yeah, obviously, um, you know, during the Renaissance, it was the church who was the major patron, right? And right. then as you, or like, you know, nobles and aristocracy and rich families and all of that. <laughs> and then people with money, right? Yeah. Um, and as, you know, as uh, like history, progressed and you get into like maybe the 1800s when Sargent was around actually like the cam the camera actually was invented around then and oh okay uh, yeah. there was a lot of artists that actually so like Soro Soroya yeah, um, Sargent yeah. like a lot of those artists actually like even tinkered with uh, even Degas uh, they tinkered with like cameras and actually used cameras to capture form but obviously cameras then aren't you know what cameras are now so you yeah. can only capture so much right but um but yeah it's, it's actually interesting I think the role of figurative painting ha has changed quite a bit um you, you know I think even now though a lot of figurative painters do portrait commissions and it is the same type of people who were you know supporting artists now as they are back then like more wealthy individuals government um Maybe, I, I mean, even the church, I, I guess. I've seen a lot of figurative artists actually do uh, more religious commissions too. So um, yeah, and I, I think a lot of contemporary portraits, um, I think it's more to evoke an emotion. So the way that I'm using portraiture, it's, yes, it is about the person I'm painting, but it's more about what the piece expresses. And so incorporating more of these abstract elements and, um, you know, maybe creating hybrid between like the realism and more of like the emotive abstract mm -hmm. sort of like ribbons that I have going on. Um, that to me, it, I'm intending to convey a feeling as opposed to maybe depicting the person exactly as they are. Yeah. Um, one of the ways, and, and I apologize if this isn't the way you like to hear your work. No, no, but um you know, the, the fragmented pieces that you have and, um, mm -hmm. you know, showing the space within what you would consider, like if you would think of Sargent, you think of the whole body being in one particular place. And I was looking at your work and finding it very interesting, you know, the, the, the places where you have decided to make that break um, between the, like, there's one where I think we're just below the shoulders that you have out on the mastery site and, it's not just like, you know, mid chest or, or anything like that. I mean, you, you've, you've gone and, and made a thought pattern throughout that, which brings you to the abstract figurative type of work that you do. So talk a little bit about that and, and tell us a little bit more, uh, because I found it interesting and beautiful at the same time, but it's like, it's like, you. where, how did she decide to make this break here, you know, is it one of these things where it goes back to our foundation that we started out talking or is it, you know, just, yeah, it feels good. Let's just do it here. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I don't think, I think I would like be lying if I said everything was like so planned. Okay. I think, you know, going, coming from like a design background too, I think I've, I've developed a sense of or like have thought a lot more about like composition too. So I'm always thinking like, okay, how how is this being balanced? Yeah. Um, so I might put like a brushstroke 
somewhere on the canvas and leave a part more untouched to kind of work with the balance of the piece. Yeah. Um, yeah, I I mean, mean, a very, a very interesting part of it could be where you were making your fragmental breaks could be the way that your eye travels through and completely off the canvas. So you have to have that, you know, what's going to grab the eye here and bring them back in. Right. And going back to our our conversation around values, like that is such a consideration when I'm planning my piece, because I want the most be the highest contrast to be like probably where the face is or the place that I want the viewer to look at first. Mm -hmm. So all of, you know, more of the abstract parts are all kind of a way to, yes, move your eye around the canvas, but also to bring it into that focal point, right? The, the person that I'm, I'm depicting. Right. Um, but in terms of like my philosophy behind it, I mean, I think there is like this kind of movement that I've been reading quite a bit about. Um, I think it was the term, I think disrupted realism was first sort of um, said by John Seed, right? So I was kind of reading more about that. And um, I think I resonated with it quite a bit because I do think now we're so disconnected from sometimes even like ourselves and from nature, sometimes even from our realities. So I kind of wanted to represent that in my own way mm-hmm. through through the work that I'm doing. And to be honest, a lot of the the people that I paint, yes, they're friends of mine or models that I, I know and that have hired to, to pose for me, but really they're, they're a lot more about how I'm feeling at that time too. So in essence, they're like kind of these like little self portraits that I'm doing. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it's, I can't say like, for, I think I, Maybe you can describe this better than I can, <laughs> but I don't think there's like one particular um, r- rationale like or like explainable rationale for why I'm leaving like a certain part untouched or like, yeah, a- as sort of um, in the background compared to, you know, okay, well, how like, I'm working know, the composition in the other areas. Yeah. And I think that comes back to one of the reasons why it's so hard for us to grab onto those particular words is here is because mm-hmm. we're actually in a zone in our converse and our whole thought process. I mean, you know, you, when you're in that zone, you're like, well, what am I going to have for dinner? You know, <laughs> yeah. you're, you're totally in there. And then something that magic is, is guiding yeah. you to do that particular thing. But I think the, the conversation around your philosophy and, and things that I think that was, you know, very well said and, and helpful. And it, and then you mentioned John Seed's name. I'm going to have to catch up with this guy again. He was on our chat years ago. And, you know, I think this is probably my third or fourth interview that I had. John's name has come up and it's like, oh, oh no way. You know, I mean, John <laughs> remembers me and, and stuff. Like that. And we've talked uh, off and on, but it's like, okay, you know, I think it's time to catch up with John again and have him come on the show too. So, um, yeah. So tell us a, a little bit. Um, have you, so you worked 10 years um, in illustration. Uh, mm-hmm. which also basically will give you a, a basis in design. Um, and yeah. then now you've been a, as a professional artist only doing your artist work for how many years? Uh, two or three. Like or it three? really hasn't been that long. Yeah. Wow. So that's, what, you know, all the, the bolt brush wins and the, the different things like that to tell you folks, this girl's talented. <laughs> <laughs> Salma Gundy, um, you know, that's that's very hard to get an exhibit or get into the exhibits there. So congratulations on. Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah. I hard work. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I I did, you know, I've, I've always been figure drawing and I've I've always loved the fine art. So it has been something that I've kept up ever since I went to, you know, school in illustration. So Mm -hmm. it wasn't as if I, you know, started kind of cold Turkey uh, uh, like, right. You know, five years ago. Right. Yeah. Um, But no, I, I think it's just a testament to one, Unlike the training at the Academy for Realist Art, like I can't, I can't kind of recommend them enough. If you are in Toronto and you want to like learn yeah. um, how to build your technique in a sustainable and, and structured way, I, I highly recommend them because yeah, they, they really taught me a lot about um, how to kind of create more realism right. um, in my work. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I just, I try to work every day I, and I try to work really hard. So yeah. that's all I can great. do. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, so I mean, but there is like a particular path that um, we all go through, whether that path is, you know, structured 
learning through universities or, or art um, institutions, you know, like you said, the, the Florence Academy and, and different places mm -hmm. like that. Um, we talked a little bit in the green room about the Art Renewal Center and, and everything that they were doing. So there are, you know, opportunities if you didn't go to college um, for that or you didn't study anything that these programs um, offer out. Uh, but I always see the same thing kind of happening over an art career. And that's, you know, you study, you know, maybe while you're doing other things, you're kind of a quote unquote hobbyist, which I don't think is a bad word. It just keeps yeah. our feet in the, you know, in the water and, and make it, you know, allows us to go day to day with what we're doing. Um, but, you know, it's, it's like you have this, this session where or this area where you're learning, which goes throughout your career, but then it's almost the decision points throughout the career where like you made the decision, okay, I've worked 10 here. I've got this background. I want to go study here. I want to learn more, which led you into your self um, career. If you know, if yeah. solo career, however you want to want to say that. And, and I've seen that pattern enough to know um, that, you know, no matter which way we start out, we probably don't have a lot of patience. <laughs> you know, it's like, hey, look at me, I've done this, this is great. And, you know, we all want those rewards um, as quickly as possible. Um, sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. And the only real thing that I can always point back to, and maybe you have other advice for folks that are out there and, and feel like they're struggling, is I always come back to, if you're if you feel like you're struggling, just keep painting, just keep learning. Any other tips that you could provide? Yeah. Um, yeah. Just keep putting your paintbrush to your canvas and yeah. keep on reading about art and learning from other artists and listening to podcasts. And I think just There's so even much having, information out there available today. Yeah. And just be a sponge. Like, I think you just have to be humble and, and know that there's always a better way to yeah. do something than what you are currently doing so to yeah. try to find that way and try to be open to other ways of either interpreting something or painting something and uh yeah be a sponge yeah Just great keep on learning yeah one of the um the things that I always look at too is uh I'm probably the worst person at setting goals <laughs> <laughs> and I should but um I had to do that a lot in my 26 years of Procter and Gamble. And it was like, yeah. oh, that was one thing I wasn't going to do in my retirement or in my, you know, switching over to art. I mean, I did have goals, but I didn't put dates around them. Like one of my goals was to do this and, you know, move forward. Um, one of the goals was to, you know, work with Kevin and, and that happened and made this mm -hmm. happen. You know, did it happen right away? What happened faster than I thought it would, but you know, it, it, um, it wasn't because I was in the right place at the right time or anything like that. It's because that's what I was working to. So I guess, you know, if you're going to set goals and you don't attain those goals in the time frame that you have them written, one of the written down for like this year, I'm going to be in five exhibitions and you make it into three. Don't consider yeah. yourself a failure because you didn't make it into the other two. Celebrate the three and move those other two to the following year coming up. I mean, just it, yeah. it's this. I guess I was surprised to read um, back a few years ago that there were over two million artists in North America and, and South or the USA alone. Now, if we add Canada and Mexico into that, we're talking, that's a lot of artists that are out there you know, learning and, and participating and exhibiting and trying to sell to the collectors that we don't know how to get to. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's great. To be honest, I, I'm at the mindset where like the more artists there are, the more people appreciate art. Yeah. So like, you know, I, I collect art too. Like I'll buy works from friends of mine. I mean, I don't have that much money, so like I'll, <laughs> I'll buy smaller things, but it, yeah, it brings me joy. Right. And I think like the more people out there doing it, like the more beautiful and, you know, maybe thoughtful the world could be. So. Yeah. And, and get out of the studio, make friends with other artists and stuff. Don't do mm -hmm. it on Facebook. Don't do it on social media. Cause there's always this negative hanging thing over social media for me. I just like yeah. so for me, if you guys get a lot out of it, go for it. You know, I'm not, not going to say don't do it, but mm -hmm. it's a great way for us to show off our work and our talent. And, and I think yeah. that's great, but I always end up seeing, you know, remarks uh, from people that aren't very kind <laughs> on those things. So, you know, dial them out. You know, don't worry. Yeah. Go do your thing. Yeah, to surround yourself with good people, yeah. like even on social media, like if somebody's yeah. following you and you know, not giving you good comments, just 
unfollow them and yeah. just focus on your art. Right? So do you have any um, funny workshop stories you, you could tell us or, or, uh, oh, God. <laughs> this uh, one's out of the blue, folks. So I might have had a <laughs> funny workshop stories. Not funny. <laughs> Actually, the workshop, the workshops that I've had recently have been pretty smooth. So that's, oh, good. that's great. Cool. Um, yeah. Thankfully, you know, knock on wood, I think, you know, <laughs> I, I'm always trying to like prepare as much as I can for, you know, things that come up because, you know, certain things always do. But uh, yeah, I've been pretty, pretty lucky that way. Um, yeah, so no plein air huh. painting or anything like that. You're pretty much in your studio the the time when you're creating. Yeah, so yeah. I, I I mean I love plein air painting, but um, obviously I live in Toronto, so it's not as <laughs> yeah, warm right out. now. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> but we have been having like a actually a really warm winter. Um, but no, I'll, I'll yeah I'll try to uh, do some plein air painting outside when I can. Um, more so because like I I've actually only got into landscape painting pretty recently, and I've I've learned that I absolutely love it. So I'm I'm going to be doing more of that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, mostly in my studio. I'm actually like moving studios right now, so my life is a bit chaotic because <laughs> of you know <laughs> I have I have just way too many art supplies. <laughs> I think over the years that I've just collected. Yeah. Um, Moving but, always brings that yeah. up. I moved from Ohio oh down God. here to North Carolina and it was just like, I started posting out on, um, I had a, a group of artist friends and, and stuff mm -hmm. in Middletown and I just start would be, okay, okay, this is in the studio. Who wants it? <laughs> Cause I'm not moving it. You know, they, yeah. Just crazy. I have a whole bunch of frames and stuff too. And like, now that I'm doing my work on panels, like just all these frames are just, yeah. I, I don't know if they're ever going to be used. So. Yeah, you, you, I need yeah. to order some canvases and I have a whole bunch of frames back there. So I need to order the canvases yeah. to the size of my frame so that I can use right. them. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're always, they, they're going to come in useful eventually. Like, I think, I think, I'm, but that's probably why I'm a little bit of a hoarder when it comes to art supplies. It's like, yeah, this is, this is going to be used yeah, sometime in the future. I don't know when. Alone. <laughs> <You're not alone. laughs> I think we're, I think that's a part of being an artist is we have I to think so too. I think so too. Hoard our, our supplies. So Ex exactly. <laughs> oh my God. Well, our, our supplies are so expensive that you, yeah. you, you want to hang on, hang on to as many as you can. And like, you never know how your practice is going to change in the future. So, you know, I might use that weird color that I just bought. <laughs> yeah. I have a, a friend, um, Joe McGurl. I don't know if you know Joe McGurl or not, but no, Joe, I um, him. Joe will be like, it's so funny. His wife will be in the kitchen, kitchen, uh, making something and mm -hmm. dinner and he'll walk by and I go, Oh, I wonder what kind of mark that takes. And then disappears into his studio and his wife's like, what happened to my, you know, my basting brush or my, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, how's the, spatulas? Hey, yeah. spatulas are great <laughs> tools for applying paint, right? Yeah. Typically when Tom is looking in his tool box for something, I, he, he can't find it. He like, yells up to the studio do you have my you know, whatever and it's like oh yeah <laughs> so yeah so sometimes tools disappear here um yeah yeah <laughs> lost into the abyss of the art studio <laughs> right <laughs> exactly so um, yeah robin let's let's talk with, about a little bit about exhibiting um sure the salma gundy and the the gallery that that um i'm sorry Desha, Desha, um, dasha dasha thank you yeah um the the Dasha Gallery and I, tell us a little bit about your experiences with that. Um, what did you think of the Salma Gundy and um, you know what? How has your gallery experience been? And yeah, so I mean, I've like when I got that response for the Salma Gundy Club, I was so grateful. Uh, that was like the first uh, show that I did last September with them, and I think the like, oh my god, I just felt like a a small fish in a really big pond because I think all of the work that Selma Gundy Club has is just absolutely fantastic and that that exhibit in particular um there were some really really striking pieces so I feel like really grateful that I was included in that and um yeah with Dasha Gallery it actually I'm doing another uh show with them this month um uh, so it's this women's group show. So I have a, a piece of exhibiting there uh, as part of my my new collection the ones with the, the kind of combined abstract and realism so yeah so it's kind of the, actually this is the first exhibit that I'm going to be showing that series in so I'm going to see you know how people react to it which is great um unfortunately I'm not making it down for New York then but um but yeah I'm, I'm curious to kind of see the re see the reaction and uh yeah Lee from Dasha Gallery is is great he's um really good yeah like really um 
great to work with. Good. And uh, yeah, I, I have a couple other galleries too. So I've, uh, I did a residency in October with uh, James Baird uh, Gallery in Pooch Cove. Yeah. And uh, yeah, he reached out to me on Instagram and I said, okay, great. I'll, <laughs> I'll go for uh, the month of October to Newfoundland. And yeah, I've, uh, I'm actually exhibiting with him now. So he has uh, a bunch of my work on, on Artsy, which is fantastic. That's another kind of venue um, with, I, I think, a lot of collectors so um yeah so I'm actually going to do a group show with him again in September nice. and uh yeah and I've actually been exhibiting too with Aben Gallery so they're in Colorado in Denver okay and yeah I'm doing a second show with them in April so a yeah. lot of group shows coming up yeah which is fantastic. fantastic yeah yeah so you want to talk a little bit about your Matrius session and um, what folks, if you want to mentor with or want to be a mentee of um, Robbins, do you yeah. tell us a little bit about what they're going to be concentrating on? Yeah, for sure. So uh, I'm concentrating on a couple of things, a couple of main sort of things. Uh, one you're is a generalist, technique. right? You're yeah, a, I'm yeah. a generalist. Yeah. Um, so technique, um, both in oil and acrylic. Um, so in that, we'll talk about brushwork. We'll talk about uh, color and value. Uh, we'll talk about rendering figures realistically and I'll be doing some demos. Um, so I'm hoping that like every second or third session that we have, um, I'll, I'll be able to kind of give a demo um, and then critique everyone's work. Yeah. And then I, because of my sort of background in commercial art, um, I can talk a little bit more about the marketing um, and exhibit, like trying to reach out to galleries. Um, I think that because I, I am still kind of new to the art world, I uh, still, I'm hoping that I can be more empathetic with a lot of the emerging artists who are part of my group um, because it hasn't been that long ago that I've had to reach out to a lot of these galleries myself and sort of craft those types of letters or you know learn how to submit to these group exhibits. Um, so all that's like really top of mind. So I'm happy to share all my experience sort of with that too during the sessions. Great. Yeah. Well, congratulations on all that you've accomplished. Um, anything else you'd like to tell us about at this point as we write? Uh, up? Yeah. Um, no, I mean, this was so lovely talking with yeah. you, Linda. I, I really appreciate the opportunity. Oh, to, you're welcome. To it was fun meeting you. So and it was so we'll, fun meeting you too. Yeah, we'll cross paths a little bit more with Matrius and, and oh, talk definitely. about this one do some other uh, cool things off to the side of that or something. I don't know. See what, what would... comes happen or happens over the, the next couple months. So um, yeah. if you are interested in looking up Robin and her Mastrius mentor um, opportunities, the email or the W whatever, the World Wide Web connection. Is <laughs> URL. The, the URL. Thank you. <laughs> you know, and I did computer work at PNG. It just went completely out of my brain. So yeah, so that'll be above us. Um, so you can mm -hmm. click on that. Mine as well will be shown there as, as well. So um, I, you know, the weird thing is, is Robin does figures. And um, as you saw through our conversation, I do land states, but we both have a very similar starting point. So it's kind of, it was interesting talking to you about how you actually started. You could tell how my interest kind of went to that when we were talking about it, because there are so many similarities, um, even though you start with figures or if you're in the landscape or any of the other types of seascapes, whatever, um, mm -hmm. you know, that's, it's that, that basic design, that foundation, that's, what's going to grab the user from across the room and make them walk to your paintings, that strong design and foundation that you have there. So check out Robin's work over on Mastrius and also at her website, which is now also flashing above us. <laughs> so, <laughs> Robin, it was great talking with you. Thank you so much for spending time with us. Thanks again, Linda. Yeah. Okay. Bye-bye, okay, everyone. Bye. Art Chat TV is brought to you by Linda Fissler Fine Art. Visit her website at lindafissler.com.